In the last session, we began the discussion with an overview of what Adhikara means and what an Adhikari is. I explained to you that basically there are two kinds of students. One is an Adhikari and the other is the normal average student. What is the difference between the two? I'm sure that all of you have either experienced this in your school times or it happened to you that there was someone in the class who was extremely talented at art. He could just draw wonderful things and was very, very good at it, so good that it looked so easy, so simple and effortless, while everybody else also enjoyed art but was maybe struggling at it. The same thing happened in perhaps in sports games. There were some who were absolutely talented in the area of sports or games. They made everything look very simple and effortless. And the others, though they enjoyed games and sports, were perhaps not as good. They had to struggle, work harder, practice a little bit more. So we notice that there is one type of student that's a natural, it's a natural talent. The others have to work hard. The same is true for math. You have those who are really absolutely like geniuses in mathematics. Every, the other hand, there are those who have to work hard. They struggle, they do well, but they still have to work very hard. So what comes easy for the Adhikari in meditation, in yoga sadhana, has to be worked at by the others. The Adhikari asks fundamental questions such as, Who am I? Questions like this, Who am I? From where have I come? Why have I come here? What is my relationship with the universe and other beings, especially human beings? What is the essential nature of my being? What am I made up of? What is the nature of the world around me? What is its cause? When did the world start? When is it going to end? Why? Why all this? What is the relationship between these things in the world and myself? Is there life after death? These deep, profound questions are asked by an Adhikari and not necessarily only as an adult. Very often we have seen in the case of an Adhikari that these questions are already present at a very young age, already in childhood, these questions occupy the mind of such a seeker. The other student, on the other hand, is very often troubled by the suffering in the world, by loneliness, by problems, which then motivate this seeker to ask fundamental questions like what is happiness? What is suffering? Why am I suffering? And this leads this seeker on to develop some sort of practice and discipline. Do you see the difference between the two? While one is a more positive, more deeper seeking seeker who is seeking from maybe even from childhood, he is led by 
also very beautiful, positive, spontaneous spiritual experiences. And these may also happen very early, already sometimes in childhood. And these beautiful experiences lead on the seeker. And that is the essential difference. Why? When you have already experienced some beautiful glimpses, you long for that. So when you have tasted something sweet, you all enjoy candies, chocolates, some nice sweets. Everybody enjoys that. And that is a different experience when you long for that beautiful experience that longing leads you is very different from that seeker who wishes to get out of suffering. These are two very different approaches to the same matter. So while an adhikari is extremely talented, has had from early childhood showed certain signs, certain indications. It does not mean that other seekers should be denied glimpses of a higher reality. They just have to work harder. They have to create a good foundation. And this foundation is what we are talking about here. We spoke about sexuality the last time and I did mention that in this session we'll be talking about food. Food is of course a very difficult subject there are no taboos around food, unlike with sexuality. But the issue with food is, it is very deeply connected to our culture, to our habits which have been formed from very early in our childhood. And this makes it very difficult to change. It is also very strongly connected with our social life. Those of you who have eaten meat or have grown up in a meat-eating family, when you suddenly change to become vegetarian, one of the biggest problems was, what do I eat when I go out with my friends? It is very difficult when everybody else is eating meat, and you don't, you're separate, you're different, you're apart. And that sense of togetherness is immediately affected. So this is very deeply related to our social life as well. This is why we need to approach changes to our diet, to our food habits, with a certain degree of self-awareness and gentleness, there is really no need to make dramatic resolutions. One can go about this in a very gentle, simple manner. What I really do like about the yogic approach to food is that it doesn't really tell you what you should eat. It doesn't give you rules on what you should eat. In modern nutrition, sci nutritional sciences, you have all kinds of approaches. You have different studies. In some studies, they tell you that non-vegetarian food is an absolute, essential, vital part of your diet. In some studies, they will tell you they have a nice little food pyramid where they tell you that grains should make up the major part of your diet. These days there are a lot of trends, food fads, 
food trends. There are so many different kind of diets. There's low carb. There's um, fat free, sugar free. There's vegetarian, vegan. There's lacto ovo, vegetarian. You know, there are all kinds of trends and fashions. The approach we are going to take is through yoga and of course a bit from Ayurveda. These are ancient sciences and I like to say that the yogis carried out studies on themselves. They didn't have studies sponsored by any lobbies. They didn't find any subjects whom to conduct these experiments on. They conducted these experiments on themselves. And this was an ongoing process and has been an ongoing process since thousands of years. So we go back to a very, very ancient tradition which has studied food in great detail. And it comes up with three basic concepts. It divides food into tamasic, rajasic and sattvic. This comes from the yoga side of and not through from the Ayurvedic side. Yoga and Ayurveda are sister sciences. So in certain areas, yoga leads in the spiritual aspect. In certain areas, Ayurveda leads the therapeutic aspect. We are here referring to people who are basically healthy. We are not referring to people who have a diseased body, who have difficulties of related to food. They need to have a look at this from a therapeutic angle. What we are referring to here is for those people who are essentially healthy. Food has a tremendous effect on practice. What is food? Very often people ask me, so what is food? If I have a cup of tea, is that food? And we say, anything that is not water is food. Because it needs to go through a certain digestion process. From a yogic perspective, there are three kinds of foods. Sattvic, Rajasic and Tamasic. When we speak about diet, we are talking about diet here, but also with respect to yogic practice and the effect it will have on yogic practice and in general on your mind and your well-being. As well, of course, as the body. Those foods that are light and easy to digest are sattvic. Sattvic foods promote and support yogic practice. While Rajasic and Tamasic food should be avoided. So some of you are already familiar with these three concepts. But of course, as we go along, we will understand these terms Sattvic, Rajasic and Tamasic better. Now the word tamas means dark, darkness. So tamasic foods, you can imagine, are those that make the body feel very heavy and make the mind dull. Now these include frozen foods, processed foods, foods which have a lot of artificial coloring, aromas, preservatives, all these things, industrial foods basically. But also Food that is overcooked, reheated too often, deep fried, kept overnight, old food essentially, is also tamasic. Now there's a special category, mushrooms and aged food. Food that's aged is considered in some parts of the world as delicacies. But from a yogic perspective, for example, aged cheese is tamasic. Breads with yeast are tamasic. Therefore, flat breads are preferred. We have chapatis, rotis in India. These are flat breads. And there are also in other 
Asian countries flatbreads and these are to be preferred to those that use raising agents like yeast. Red meats, beef, lamb, pork are also considered to be tamasic. They're very heavy. White sugar, all sugar drinks, aerated drinks are tamasic. Alcohol, drugs and intoxicants of any kind are also tamasic. What does alcohol do to the mind? Makes you dull. Drugs make you dull. Intoxicants. Sugar, for example, a lot of people ask, why is sugar considered to be thumbsick? Actually, sugar makes you hyper. It initially makes you a little bit more alert and active, a little bit more hyper, but then it makes you feel dull. The sugar goes into the bloodstream really fast and then it doesn't go slowly into the bloodstream as natural sugars do. So that is tamasic food. Are there any questions so far on tamasic food? Chapati also comes under tamasic food. Sorry, what is that? Chapati, that is wheat chapati. That is coming under this one. No, no. As I just mentioned, that's a flat bread. And that is not considered to be tamasic. No, no. The only breads which are tamasic are those that have been raised, you know, like the normal toast bread, white breads. Yes. These are considered yes. to be tamasic. These are also industrialized products. They have a lot of chemicals in it. So all these are considered tamasic. Yeah. Okay, thank you. So essentially any food that makes you feel heavy physically, makes the body feel heavy, makes the mind feel dull, is considered to be tamasic. This list is not exhaustive. There may be things that I have not mentioned here. So if there's something where you have doubts, you can always ask. Rajasic foods. Rajasic foods are those that stimulate the mind and body in excess. In excess, they cause irritation, aggression, hyperactivity, and sleeplessness. Also, that food which is extremely pungent is Rajasic. You know, when you put a lot of chilies in the food, this is considered to be Rajasic. Heavy grains, wheat, heavy lentils are also Rajasic. So certain lentils, like these big beans, you know, they are rajasic. There are lighter ones, like moong, you know, which is not rajasic, that is sattvic. Wheat is a very heavy grain. There are other grains which are lighter that can be eaten. Unfortunately, these days, people are eating too much wheat in there's a lot of breads and they're all made of, almost all are made of wheat. So it is a good practice to try to have a variety of grains, have a variety of different um, lentils as well. For those of you who are vegetarian, in any case, the major part of your diet would be grain and lentils. That would be the main main part of your diet. Garlic, chilies, onions are rajasic. I know that those of you who are from India, there is a lot of garlic, chili and onions in food. Please remember this is rajasic. It does not mean that now you should just stop having all these things, but be mindful of what this does to your body as well as to the mind. And it can be had in smaller quantities when we prepare milder food for example mild, mildly spiced beverages such as black tea green tea and coffee are also rajasic people ask green tea i thought green tea was healthy why is it rajasic well as i said the way we analyze it is different it's not about healthy and unhealthy 
It's about the effect this has on your body and the mind. While green tea is not different from black tea, it's actually the same thing. In black tea, the tea leaves are processed. In green tea, the tea leaves are not really processed. So it is a little bit healthier, but in terms of the caffeine in it, it remains the same. So it will have an impact on your mind. For example, if you have it later in the day or in the evening, it might keep you awake. It, it, will, it will make a difference to, to your mind. You will find yourself, it, like it peps you up. And too much green tea has the same effect as too much black tea. White meats, such as poultry and fish, are also rajasic. Eggs too are rajasic. So we see that food has been classified according to the way it affects your body and mind. Any questions about Rajasic foods so far? Okay, then we go on to Sattvic foods. Sattvic foods are those that purify the body, do not allow toxins to build up in the body. Some may ask now, what are toxins? The concept comes from Ayurveda. In Ayurveda, it's called Ama. A-M-A, Ama. Ama means that over a period of time, certain things are retained in the body. This is a different science from modern science. So it's not a toxin as necessarily a chemical substance, but... With certain practices, yogic practices and fasting, the body feels lighter. It goes through a process of purification. But these light foods, sattvic foods, the body maintains its state of purity. Remember that the yogis did not conduct experiments like modern science. They did not... Uh, Think in terms of chemicals, they do not think in terms of um, studying people, but they studied the effect on their own bodies. And so they saw that with certain foods they felt lighter, they were more energetic, they, they, think, they could think better, they were sharper, more attentive. And these are the qualities that sattvic foods provide us with. So sattvic foods are those that are freshly cooked, that is freshly cooked and easy to digest. Almost all fruit and vegetables are sattvic. Figs and lemons are especially sattvic. Grains like unpolished rice and oats are also sattvic. Buckwheat and millet, these are not uh, traditional grains, these are different. So these are also sattvic legumes such as moong dal, chickpeas, chana dal, moong beans. These are sattvic. Spices such as fresh ginger, turmeric, coriander, cumin, cardamom, cinnamon, saffron are sattvic. Spices are really, they add spice to life, so they are very important. They make the food tastier. One enjoys the food. This is a really important aspect of food is that food should be made with a great deal of love and care. It should taste good. You should enjoy your food. Food that is not well spiced is considered to be tamasic. Food that is not tasty is considered to be tamasic. Among milk products, Fresh yogurt and ghee are sattvic. Ghee is 
considered to be uh, it's very highly regarded in the Ayurvedic science and so is fresh yogurt but ghee is a particularly um, <clears throat> is of, of great importance given very great importance fats are they, they add flavor these days fats have been sort of given a bad name everybody thinks that fats make you fat so they always advise you to have less fats but it's not fats that make you fat it's possible that because things that have fat in it are tasty and you eat too much of it that you become fat but fats on the on eaten in a certain amount is healthy because they add flavor to the food and it's important to eat food that is well spiced and tastes good sweeteners such as natural honey and jaggery are sattvic what is jaggery jaggery is uh, is like molasses out of out of the sugar cane so it is a very uh, thick um hard rock like product out of sugar and um you have to break it and this is very hot in the the weather where you are when it's a little bit soft otherwise it's very hard and that's called jaggery and that is basically sugar cane juice the molasses from sugar cane from sugar cane and it is not refined so it has a lot of vitamins and other nutrition in it seeds like sesame and flax are also sattvic sprouts of different variety also fall into this category so you can see that there are a lot of things that are sattvic and sattvic food helps in digestion it keeps your weight under control because most of these foods are not really fattening it gives you a lot of energy and mentally it keeps you light and attentive you all may have noticed after extremely heavy meal in the afternoon you feel very sleepy and if you were working in office then you know you start getting drowsy and you don't feel like working you are not able to pay attention so it's important then to have a light meal which is easy to digest any questions so far regarding sattvic foods okay so a sattvic diet has a lot of variety in color one of the ways we can learn to think is how do i get a lot of nutrition in my food Now, unless you are a nutritionist who knows all these things how do you know what is a healthy diet but one of the signs of a good food apart from its freshness is variety when you have a variety of things a variety of grains a variety of lentils a variety of vegetables sprouts spices sweeteners have different things you will get all the nutrition that you require as well as color foods of different colors provide us with all the nutrition we require so you have something like green spinach you have blueberries when you eat the blueberries inside they are purple the papayas and orange beetroots which are red or mangoes that are very deep yellow and these different colors they signal to the mind that this is good food this has got a lot of nutrition have you seen sometimes in a good restaurant or in a nice maybe you invited to a, a feast or wedding or special event 
you you see the buffet or you see a table full of different foods, you see a lot of different colors. The more colorful it is, the more everybody goes, oh wow, how wonderful, what great food. And if you see a diet that's not very good, it's very monotonous. The colors, there is not much color, it all looks the same. So color signals to the mind, this is good food. So color is very important. Milk is a big question mark for a lot of people because earlier milk was considered to be very important bodybuilder, very important for children. And today milk is considered to be uh, almost enemy number one by a lot of people who have issues with lactose intolerant. There are those people who have ethical issues because they say the milk is meant for the calf. There's no other species on this planet that has the milk of another species. So why are humans having milk from cows? So not wanting to enter into any kind of debate and looking at this purely from a yogic perspective, earlier fresh milk was considered to be sattvic. But today, industrialized milk is, is, is tamasic. Any product, any food product that is industrialized, packaged, is tamasic. It goes through processes of homogenization, pasteurization, distribution where it's long shelf life, all these things create, um, yeah, is industrialized food. Also, the places where the calves are kept, the dairies, have poor air, poor light and space condition, creating a lot of stress for the animals. So how can such calves give us sattvic milk? So for those of you who want to continue to have milk, organic milk is an option since the cows live on better conditions. And another option to consider is goat's milk. Since goat and sheep milk has not been, is as yet not as industrialized as cow's milk. So you may find some products that uh, are still might be still considered to be natural. Some of you, if you live somewhere close to a farm, might want to try your hand at seeing if you can get fresh milk from directly from a farm. But it seems to be almost impossible. During our sabbatical, uh, we were in the Himalayas, in the Garhwal mountains, and Joachim and I visited some people up in the mountains, the mountain folk, and it was wonderful to see that everybody there had their own cow. They had a couple of cows and they would milk their own cows. And every day they had a little bit of milk. After the calf had had the milk, the rest of the milk the family could have. And it was nice to see because that is really fresh milk. It was boiled a couple of times and then it was, it was enjoyed. And that is, of course, not industrialized. That is sattvic milk. So, now we come to fats and oils. This is a very important ingredient. Sesame oil and ghee are sattvic. One can use also other oils and fats if you wish, but keep in mind that these two are sattvic. It's always best to use filtered oils, they're also called native or native virgin oil. Do not use refined and processed oils. If the oil says refined oil, processed oils, these are, these are tamasic oils, do not use these. These have gone through a very 
detailed process of industrialized process before they come to you. Any questions so far? Good, then we continue. Salt, salt of course, is extremely important. Refined table salt is again a chemical product. It is completely thermosic. Please use natural salt, rock salt. You also get um, salts, sea salt, which is uh, pure and has not been refined. It has been cleaned, but it's not been refined. And these salts, they contain different trace elements and minerals. Normally, when you have a table salt, a common salt, it's actually NaCl, it's sodium chloride. But normally, if you see what we used earlier, 40, 50 years ago, people did not have refined salt. They had normal salt. This salt considered also con consisted also of other salts. There was also potassium chloride and other things in it. These are trace elements, and these are very important. Always practice before meals, therefore it's not possible to practice on a full stomach. Now, we have finished the part about the foods. Is there any question from anybody about specific foods? Shriram asks, for how long does the effect of a Rajasik or Tamasik meal persist? It depends on your meal. Why don't you try it out? Eat a Rajasik meal and then tell me. Eat a Tamasik meal and tell me. It all depends on the meal, how much you have and what you have. There is no fixed time. So coming now to the section about practice. If you are practicing the morning before breakfast, that's perfect. But if for some reason you are not able to get the timings right, some people say, oh, I just cannot manage and then I have to practice after a meal. Remember that you will need to have at least two hours after a light meal. You can't practice immediately. You have to wait for two hours if you've had a light meal. And if it's a heavy meal, a big meal, then you need to keep four hours. So this is why we always relate our practice timings to food. So always it is before breakfast, before lunch, before the evening meal, and then the last practice before going to bed. And because you pra if you practice also before you go to bed at night, it's important that you have enough time and that you don't practice immediately after dinner. So you need to have early dinner. This, in any case, is a very good thing to do, having early dinner. In many countries of the world, this depends on the culture, warmer countries, people tend to eat later. In colder countries, people tend to eat earlier. So, of course, that may create issues for you if you are living in a warm country and if everybody's eating later and you eat alone early, that's not very nice. But keep this in mind and see how you can adjust. <coughs> We come to the topic of fasting. A lot of people ask about this and many people like to do some extreme kind of fast. They think that this is spirituality or this is related to
to their development somehow and they sometimes do extreme fast it's a form of torture self torture and it is actually said that the best kind of fast is a daily fast which is keeping a 12 to 14 hours gap between dinner and breakfast the word breakfast comes from break the fast you break the fast because at night you don't eat and you have a gap between dinner and breakfast if you have very heavy meals very late then you can't eat breakfast very early so you need to keep 12 to 14 hours this allows the body to purify itself there is a cleansing process that the body goes through normally the body gets only enough time to go through the digestion process but if the body has more time it goes through a deeper cleansing process including regeneration during the night the body is very busy housekeeping it's cleaning and it's regenerating this is why it's important to get good sleep so the daily fast is actually the best form of fasting is the best thing you can do for yourself if you are health conscious it will also help those who have issues with weight if you're a little bit overweight daily fast will also help there if you have had a heavy meal in the evening is best better to keep a 14 hour fast rather than going on crash diets and extreme fast it's really much better to adopt the daily fast those who have major health issues like severe diabetes they should consult a physician of course before keeping daily fast manisha i don't know why the oops uh, says going back to oils what do you recommend for tarka tarka is tempering of spices for those of you who don't know so you can use a light oil uh, <laughs> such as uh, sesame oil but you can also use sunflower oil and um, as long as they are refined there are a lot of um, oils there so of course uh, it's difficult to give a general recommendation but in but these these two are good peanut oil is very expensive but peanut oil is very good as well generally people don't use peanut oil because it tends to be a little bit more expensive uh, what you shouldn't use uh, just to say um mustard oil mustard oil is very strong and has a very very um almost a spicy uh, taste to it after all it's mustard so that's not something i would recommend so mild oils mild and um oils that are uh, you you will see it form the kind of oil uh, rather than using thick oils use thinner oils which flow easily some people like to use coconut oil these days well that's also an option it has a stronger flavor so it doesn't necessarily taste good with everything okay so i spoke about the daily fast any questions about the daily fast
good. Shibu's doing the daily fast, that's nice. Anybody else doing the daily fast? Anybody who wants to share his or her experience? Stuart, okay. You wanna, can you talk? Can you tell us about it? Okay, seems he cannot talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can be longer than 14 hours as well. Um, one just should make sure that um, one doesn't overdo it because um, after 16 hours it starts getting a little bit too long. It all depends on the last meal, of course. Okay, you're traveling so you can't talk, that's okay. All right, so just a few tips about um, eat slowly with awareness. Lots of people these days are eating on the go, eating while looking at their mobile, eating, <laughs> or, you know, while, while traveling and looking at their mobile. So it's important to be mindful about food. So to increase your awareness while eating, it might be useful to count the number of times you chew your food. Of course, a very boring thing to do. So much nicer simply to cultivate awareness. Absent-minded eating of food while walking, watching television, surfing the internet, reading books, comics, checking mobile. This is not healthy and generally leads to overeating. And that, of course, leads to obesity, diabetes, and many other health issues. So, most important, never overeat. The yogis have a hand rule for this. Fill half the stomach with solids, quarter with liquids, not water, but liquids, and keep a quarter empty. What are the things you could have with food, liquids, it could be uh, a yoga drink or some herbal teas, juices, all these are considered to be liquid. Uh, in India, we also have a lot of, um, especially down south, we have the dals, the, the, the lentils, which are cooked in a lot of water. So there is a lot of water in the food as well, or soups that are not very thick. There's already a lot of water in the food. So when the water is with the food, these are liquids. And so the, the food is not really dry and hard. Very often in the West, you have a concept of having a chunk of meat, some potatoes or some vegetable with that. And there is not much fluid in that food, it's very dry. While in many Asian meals, there's a kind of a gravy. Uh, or there are lentils which have liquid in it. So there's a lot of... The food is not dry, there's this liquid in it. So we talk about half the stomach with solid, quarter with liquid, does not include water and keep a quarter empty. We should not drink water while eating. It's best to have the water before foods, uh, at least half an hour before food, and not immediately after food either. As far as possible, eat freshly cooked, mildly spiced foods. Avoid heavy foods, especially in the evening. Have regular meals at fixed times. Now, this is important because it prepares the body and the mind for absorption and assimilation of the food and the nutrition. Those who are busy or travel a lot need to find flexible and creative solutions. One option is to carry healthy home-cooked meals. Earlier, this was considered to be strange 
at least in the West, but it's getting more acceptable. And in many Asian countries, this was an old practice to carry home cook, cooked meals. That, on the other hand, is changing where people find that to be boring and rather eat outside. So, it's, it's important to have good food and yet leading busy lives. It's important to find also a compromise and a creative solution to that. So it's important to drink lots of liquids, especially water, throughout the day. So this quantity of two liters, which I put there, is only a very rough indication. You may need more liquids if you're, if you're sick, if you're down with fever or have diarrhea, or if you're doing sports or in summer, or you even exposed to a lot of cold air. You know, you'll experience it in your mouth. Mouth is dry. So liquids are important, but I don't mean your black tea and coffee or green tea because these also have the effect of drying out the body. So they have a diuretic effect, so it's important that you have normal liquids. The best thing you can drink is water, just fresh, bubble-free water, just normal water without gas in it. Avoid sugar drinks, completely avoid sugar drinks and instead of tea and coffee you can substitute that with some herbal teas which you can make yourself. Just pour some hot water over fresh ginger and ginger tea is ready, it's very simple. You can do the same with peppermint leaves, tulsi leaves or make a nice herbal mix with different spices such as saffron, cardamom, cloves, cinnamon. This is these are simple things. They make a big difference. To continuously have tea and coffee, this is terrible for the mind. It is terrible for the entire nervous system. They agitate, they, they excite, they stimulate, and then they also have an addictive quality to it. So it's very important that if you are seriously interested in practicing, developing, that you are um, taking care of some of these things. You can experiment to see how food impacts you. You may notice that food is deeply connected with emotions. When sad or disappointed, you want to eat comfort foods like chocolate. So food is not only nourishing for the body, it's also nourishment for the mind. And you see how the food will affect the mind and nourish it. So most of us are motivated by our sense of taste rather than appetite. So you tend to eat more when the food is tasty. Often we experience a hunger for food that is determined by taste and memories. If you have a childhood memory of eating a certain cake prepared by your grandmother, then it brings up certain memories when you have that cake again and that makes you feel good. So the desire for certain food is often connected to good positive memories, maybe from childhood. So as far as possible, eat only when really hungry and do not burden the stomach with more food if there is no appetite. Now, that's a lot of stuff on food. You can well imagine why food can become problematic. When we try to do everything right, following these things here, what happens is your diet will probably not look anything like it is or what it used to be. And when you go out somewhere, it becomes very difficult to maintain that kind of diet. When you are on social visits or you're with family, friends, then you become a bit of an odd person there. That's why it's important that we understand the impact of this on ourselves, the culture around us, and the social aspect of it, 
and try not to become a food Nazi. I just say that jokingly, tongue in cheek, because food Nazi is somebody who is just very rigid about food. There have been in the past, especially in India, a lot of religion surrounding food, which became so excessive that we lost touch with reality of you know, just being good human beings, you know, you, you turn food into something else. And so remember above all to be gentle to yourself and kind and patient with your surroundings when you are trying to change your diet. So some of the important points to remember are drink one to two liters of water every day. Keep a daily fast, 12 to 14 hours a day. Fill the stomach with food, one quarter with liquids other than, sorry, liquids other than water, and one quarter empty, never overeat. Do not eat between meals. Have three to four meals daily at regular times. Do not keep food overnight. Prepare food daily. Fresh food is the best. You may need there to have a kind of a strategy. <laughs> you know, certain things maybe you want to cook on the weekend and, and freeze. And certain things you prepare fresh. Especially if you happen to be alone. And it's no fun cooking just alone for yourself and making it every day. So keep these things in mind and find the best solution for yourself. None of these things are meant to be rigid rules that will make you miserable. They're supposed to make you happier and healthier. So do not keep food overnight or isopan and eat food slowly and consciously. Avoid coffee, black tea and green tea. Drink Freshly made herbal teas without sugar and stir and eat only when you're hungry. So that's a lot on food, a lot to think about, a lot to apply, hopefully as well. Any questions about food, anything on food, whatever we discussed or some other question? Next sessions are we will be covering sleep as well as the deepest of all fountains self preservation. I'll be talking about a very difficult topic like death and the impact of these on our practice, on our daily life, our approach to life. And um, sleep is very essential. And most of us these days seem to be suffering from chronic deficit of sleep. So that's something that we need to, to also look at. So the next few sessions, we will continue this discussion. And hope to see you next time. And uh, a nice weekend for everybody. Bye-bye. Yeah, bye, Sylvie. Bye, Manish.